I think the word's out. I think in the future we're going to do nothing but grow. If you make the musicians happy, trust me, your patrons are going to be happy. Yeah. Because the musicians are going to play this place in a different way than they play anywhere else. It's called St. Stephen's Music Hall, and it is just about as cool a room as you will ever see. My first choice was Chammy's. It's got like a cheers ring to it. Hey, man, it you want to go down the street and go to Chammy's and have a beer? You're not telling that story accurately. Because <laughs> that sounds remember, pretty good. I remember you telling me Chammy's, and I was just like, I, I, I was still open to a name. I was kind of fond of St. Stephen's, but uh, the Chammy's thing, I just, I didn't, I didn't want it to have my name on it. Oh, well, yeah, I just, I, don't, I, get I don't like the attention. Yeah. So, so we're rolling. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, world. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> so uh, welcome to season three of Pickle Tato. You guys are probably going to be the first one that we posted. Don't know the date yet, but this is the first one for the new season. Today, we got John Chamnus and Evan Billiter here. With uh, If you can look in the background, St. Stephen's Music Hall. We're here at Campus 805. I uh, really appreciate you guys agreeing to do this. Uh, me and some friends of mine and some family members came here. And she told me about it. I, I'd heard about it, but she didn't, you know, she, she's the driving force of all this stuff, right? Sure. <laughs> um, so she's like, we got to go down there and check this thing out. Because I don't know if you know it. You probably know it. There's a live feed in here every night from somebody on Facebook. There's always <laughs> somebody that's, oh. that's uh, you know, doing live stuff. And you can go on there and watch what's going on. <clears throat> and that's kind of what drove her to, hey, we need to go check this place out. So when we came in here, we were probably about an hour and a half or so before the band started. And it was about yeah, y'all were half, pretty early. It's maybe half, half full or so, but man, thirty minutes before they started, this place—I mean, you couldn't walk in here. So, I think the word's out. I think you guys are going to do, are going to be doing. Well, you're already doing a great job, but I think uh, in the future you're going to do nothing but grow. <clears throat> but that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, I guess first off, I want to get a little bit of your backgrounds. I, are you guys both Huntsville natives? Grew up I here. Am. I born. Okay. I was born, and raised here. Yeah. Evan came here at eight. Is that right? I've been here thirty-eight years. Yeah. Okay. I think, yeah, I was born in uh, Perth, Western Australia. Oh, sweet. Um, in 1976 and moved here in 1984. Lived in Perth and lived in Brisbane, Queensland. I was a PK. My dad was a, uh, a missionary preacher <laughs> um, and started some churches in Australia. And then we moved back here to Huntsville and been in Huntsville pretty much ever since. Yeah. Lived in Phoenix for a year, but pretty yeah. much in Huntsville ever since. For the record, if you see me rolling my eyes, there's chairs on the floor above us. I was yeah, not rolling my eyes at Evan's story. We'll, we'll, tell a story about, we'll tell a story about that here in a little bit. Thanks for clearing that up. We're going to get in everything. In I, you said God, something. I went, shut oh, up, Evan. God. <laughs> here he goes again about Perth. Perth, who cares? <laughs> my God. All the ladies love you from Australia. I get it. I get it. Uh, he doesn't even have an axe. So you guys met, you guys met at uh, some festival, right? That what, is correct. What, what festival was this at? Uh, it used to be called MAGFest. I think that's... At down the Spirit Swanee uh, Park in uh, Live, Live Oak, Florida. Live Oak, Florida. A lady named Beth Judy runs it. She's awesome, and she does a spring one and a fall one. And I think it was the fall one in 2001. I was working in Atlanta at the time, and my mother called me and said, Hey, we're at this festival in Florida. Come down here. I was like, All right, I ain't got nothing to do this weekend. So I, I jumped in the car and ran down there, and he'd come down there with them. And uh, we just hit it off pretty pretty quickly. Which is funny that we both lived in Huntsville. Yeah, that is and we met in Florida. Florida. Well, that's what I was going to say. You said you were in Atlanta, but you were you were actually living in Huntsville. I was and, a contractor for AT and T for about five years, uh, okay. and I was working in Atlanta. And gotcha. I, I literally was homeless for about four years because I was gone so much. I sold my house, yeah. um, and I just happened to be in Atlanta at the time. But I literally lived out of a hotel for almost five years. Mm. So, well, a year of that, I lived in Detroit. I actually got an apartment. But. Go Lions. Go Lions. Uh, We're both Lions fans, <laughs> by the way. Uh, you know, everybody's got their downfalls. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to get to what the conception of this was, but I know there's some background of, of why this would work and, and your ideas that, that made this idea happen. So, if you like, to, I'd like to talk about a little about micro, Microwave Dave. I'd heard about this foundation for a while since I've been here, but I, I, I didn't, to be honest with you, I hadn't known much about it until I've read up on it. Um, I know that's pretty prestigious here in Huntsville. Everybody knows about it. Can you talk a little bit where that came from, how that started, and your involvement in it? Yeah. Um, so 10 years ago, we're having our 10th anniversary for Microwave Dave Day this year. 
So a little over 10 years ago, a group of music lovers and just community-minded people that were friends with Microwave Dave, and, um, you know, we, we were seeing him do, do so many community uh, activities and, and playing for free for churches and just really sweet man, real humble man. And one of the main things he did was uh, going into elementary schools and talking to kids about the blues mm. and the origin of the blues and how the blues came from slavery, right. literally, sure. from the fields of, 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 of cotton. Uh, in the cotton fields and um just a really neat story there and going into these schools that probably didn't know anything about the the genre of blues he'll ask them hey have you heard the blues they all raise their hand yeah you haven't heard the blues <laughs> like but, <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but he he's been doing that over 35 years yeah. and um so what we did in that gathering and it was at south side bandito which makes the even cooler part of that story <laughs> um and we all just said well what can we do for dave and we were like oh we're gonna create an event and I'll get on the horn because I was, uh, I created and was booking music for the concerts on the dock at Low Mill. Mm. I'd been working with a bunch of bands and community kind of uh, events uh, before then. And I said, man, I'll just call everybody up. So it was Dave Anderson, Alan Little. It was uh, Mike, every single big name and, and medium sized, small name. It didn't matter. I was just calling everybody. Everybody said yes. Yeah. Everybody. So we had this booked at the old lumberyard. And uh, we're fired up. I mean, it's just, we're so excited. And then we're like, oh, we got to ask Dave about it now. (laughs) (laughs) Three quarters of this festival was booked. I mean, all the location, everything. And then we had to sit down with Dave and he's like, I'm not real thrilled about the idea. Oh, no. And it it had nothing to do with um, the fact that his friends were gathering and it was music and all that. He's just like, I don't want it to be about me. And so uh, Dennis Keim, who has been the vice president of the foundation, I've been the president for nine and a half years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, he and I and Rick Godfrey from uh, the da- Microwave Dave and the Nukes, we met at this bandito across okay. the street here yeah. on Governor's Drive. And uh, Rick said, man, I think we should bring a different approach to Dave and say, we'll start a foundation, a nonprofit, and we'll um, continue the work in the schools of what he's doing. So for the last nine, nine and a half years, I've been also the director of the Concerts in the Classroom program, which is all about teaching kids through music and art integration when it comes to a musician playing music, but then also teaching a lesson in their regular curriculum. So teaching a science lesson, talking about sound frequencies, how does a guitar work? How does your hearing work? These type of things. So we've been doing that probably about 7,500 to 8,000 students we've served in in nine and a half years all over North Alabama. And now we have a a scholarship program as well. So it's, uh, we're up to six scholarships a year that we give away free for year long. So that's, um, you know, that was just a passion of mine. I wasn't getting paid for that. I I do now, but um, that's a little bit of background in regards to the value of music to me personally. And Mm -hmm. like what I wanted to be involved in, um, that that just is part of of my process and my past yeah. and getting to getting to today yeah yeah that's a great story man <clears throat> so let's get let's uh, just pull this bandaid off you ready <laughs> so you might hear this in the audio but we got some chairs that are squeaking above yeah. us so being in, in a venue like this has there been any issues that have popped up um i know we you know when this first started it was basically a brewery right it's like hey we got this old school we don't want to turn it you know we don't want to tear it down we want to make make something some kind of event thing here. So they opened up to a brewery initially, right? I so, think, I mean, I think the plan, is, it was always to be what it is. Right. It was just a matter of just booking, getting people in the spaces. Yeah. So now so, it's become, shoot, like a main hub of Huntsville now, right? I mean, I know, especially from the Arsenal, they have a lot of stuff that comes here during mm-hmm. the day for events and everything. And then at nighttime, it's always, always something going on here. Mm-hmm. So having multiple different venues in this I'm sure it has its, its its issues with each and yeah each occupancy. I mean, um, there's a club on the other side of this wall behind us that that does karaoke, and then it, when it's not karaoke, it's pretty much club music. So yeah. it's you you don't notice it when a band's playing, but the right. minute they stop, you can hear the yeah. Because <laughs> we insulated this wall, which killed a lot of the higher frequencies, but to kill low frequencies, it just takes mass. Yeah, so. Uh, this interview would not exist right now right. if they were having yeah. Yeah. anything yeah. happen across. Uh, well, it wouldn't have initially when we first, and then now it's like we've gotten, like I said, we've gotten all of it but the base, and, and 
And it has bothered some musicians playing here. Like, man, it's kind of messing up my timing with this bass lick behind me that's not yeah. <laughs> at the speed I'm at. But it's just part of it. I mean. Well, I wonder if bass traps work. No. No, you tried that. To... That's more, because uh, we have educated ourselves okay. a lot on this. That's more for uh, the treat toning the your room. room. It's not for stopping. So. Ah, okay. Not sound so The only thing that stops bass is mass. So yeah. concrete. You know, mm. layers and layers and layers of drop. Well, I actually found there's a British guy who put, put a video on YouTube and he actually did a formula for how many sheets of drywall you need to get to for a 10% reduction in base. And for every 10% in dBs, you had to have a three quarter inch piece of sheetrock. So, like, to get it all, like, we literally <laughs> need like four inches of sheetrock. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I guess we jumped ahead a little bit. I just want to get that but, out of the way. <laughs> so, who came up with the concept of this or who even had the idea of to open something like this up here at Campus 805? Did, did you have so any prior? It didn't start here. Okay. Yeah. Did you have any prior bar or? Not really. No. I mean, bar, we that? both bartended a little here and there. No. But, uh, no, we had a space about a block from here that, uh, let's see. We looked at, we talked to the landlord in the summer of 20. Two mm. about getting the space. Okay. Um, there was a tenant in it that was way behind on rent. She said she was going to evict them, and then they paid a little bit, and she let them stay a little longer. And it ended up that we didn't get the space. I signed the lease on January 1st of 2023. She called me that morning and said they're moving out. And, um, well, unbeknownst, so prior to that, we had been looked at, everywhere so did you already have the idea with a no, yeah to, okay and we were just trying we already had the idea we had the name and we were just trying to find a space yeah. and the zoning laws in the city of huntsville it's difficult sure. to have a lounge mm. if you're serving if you serve food it's different but to have a true blue lounge it's difficult and uh they in light, so this area is zoned light industrial. In light industrial, it was not that hard. Well, then in December of 2022, they changed the laws and the limitations that existed in some of the other business districts. They also placed in light industrial. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, we signed our lease on January 1st, 2023. So when I called the the city to get a business license, they said, well, have you got approval from zoning? And I said, no. And uh, so, well, this, we just need to call them. I'm sure it won't be a big thing. Well, it turned out to be a massive thing. Mm. And uh, the lady was telling me on the phone, like, you can't be within a 1,000 feet of an existing lounge. I said, no, that's in C1 and C5. I'm in L1. That's not the case. And she said, no, it is. And I said, no, it's not. She said, yes, it is. I said, lady, I'm looking at the law on your website right now, and that is not there. She said, no, there's th five items under there. I said, no, there's three. I'll take a picture of it and send it to you if you don't believe me. Mm -hmm. And she pulled it up. She goes, oh, we hadn't updated the website. I was oh, like, geez. well, that's a you problem. <laughs> right. You know, you need to grandfather me in or something because yeah. the law wasn't there when I signed the lease. Mm. And, yeah, they weren't hearing that. And uh, I was like, we have bars next to bars all over the place, all over town. Like, this is crazy. And uh, And whenever I'd bring up an example, they'd say, well, we're not talking about them. We're talking about you. Where they say, well, they got a variance, or they got a variance, or they got a variance. I said, well, it sounds like everybody's got a variance. I guess I need to get me one, Right, too. where do you get that at? <laughs> yeah, uh, get me one of them variances. <laughs> so we fought for a variance, spent a lot of money on surveys and architectural renderings for parking and, <clears throat> excuse me, lighting plans for parking and uh, and never even got to go before the zoning board mm. because someone in the neighborhood objected because to get a variance, you have to send letters to every property owner within 500 foot radius of you, and, wow. and someone objected. I'm like, so. So if it's just one person. So one done? person says no, and all these other people that want to say yes, it don't matter what they say. And they were said, no, we can't do it. Mm. So we were 864 feet from a lounge. <laughs> well, you know, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Right? And it, it it's, it's better here. We get a lot of foot traffic. We've not have gotten, you would have to make a point to go to St. Stephen's there. No. You wouldn't just wander upon it, mm -hmm. even though it's only a block from here. So we came here. So finally I saw this space open up and, uh, called the, the, uh, management company and they 
we came and looked at it, and uh, I just called Evan and said, dude, we're moving. I give up. No. I give up. They win. And uh, so I called. Like, the, like they usually do. This is the best part. <laughs> I, called, I called the zoning office, and I said, look, I was standing in the lobby of the real uh, the Scripture Realty owns this place, and they're in the Huntsville Times building. I was standing outside the elevator, and I, I was like, well, let me call the zoning department before I do anything. I say, hey, we're going to move it. This is in an arts and entertainment district. We were 200 feet outside the arts and entertainment district at the other spot. And, uh, well, that came through the mics. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Hey, he's a good editor. And, you uh, probably won't even hear it. <laughs> um, I said, hey, I'm, look, y'all win. I give up. I'm moving. I'm going to move into the arts and entertainment district. She goes, oh, that's great. This makes it so much easier. I said, okay, so if I move into the arts and entertainment district, all this variance <laughs> crap goes away, right? No more variances. She's like, no, you just fill out this form. Send it in. I'll send it right back. Cool. Send me the form. So I go out, sign the lease, fill out the form, send it in. That was in November of 23. Got a phone call on January the 9th, 6th or the 9th of 24 saying hey you got to get a variance like, what the f <laughs> <laughs> no in no a, in that building. conversation that we had no we have a recording I'm, I'm on my way down there there's a different person that called <laughs> yeah. i was like no i don't want to talk to you i want to talk to the people i've been dealing with no. so I, I was like i'm on my way i go down there and they're like yeah you got to have a variance i said well, i was told i didn't need one you know and uh so the problem with getting a variance is you have to have everything done and turned in by the first of the month for the board meeting. It's at the end of the month. What I found out on January, whatever the six, mm -hmm. I'd already missed the deadline for yeah. February. So now I had to turn everything in by February to get on the March docket and, uh, or I had to turn in the, everything by the end of January to get on the February docket. Well, in February we had a little ice storm here and apparently that, made it to where some people couldn't make it so they delayed the february meeting to to march Man. and it was just like and the whole time when you know we're paying rent we're paying live insurance liquor liability insurance mm -hmm. which is insanely excruciatingly expensive and uh and they just they're just bleeding us dry but we finally got it i mean we got the we got approval for the variance, and then there was a 10-day grace period or 15-day or some grace period on that before you couldn't do anything so that if anybody objected, they could sue you in civil court. Mm. So then the grace period was up on that, got my business license, sent that to the uh, – so we had booked a show here on March the 30th for this band was having their record release party. Like, we couldn't Grand, grand opening. We booked Kinda. it in January, yeah. so I was like, sure, March 30th. We'll long be open by then. Yeah. And uh, – it was March 22nd, I think, and I still don't even have a liquor license. So <laughs> I, I took it down. I took my approval from the city down to the ABC office on South Parkway, and a lady named Donna Sel Segway, Solway, so so nice. And I said, Donna, I'll kiss your feet. Whatever I can do to expedite this, because I've got a show Saturday and it's mm. Tuesday. Yeah. Am I going to make it? And I need to tell these guys we're not. And she's like, I think you'll make it. I think you'll make it. And I was like, please, just anything you can do. She that called, was at, that she, was at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. And at 2 p.m., I get an email from Donna. I'm like, Lord, she probably needs something else. She's was, variance. <laughs> yeah. And it was our liquor license. Oh, nice. We got it in five hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> we got liquor license Tuesday and opened Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. With no liquor, beer, anything behind the bar at all. We had to make our orders, come in Friday. And then have it for that oh, Saturday wow. night. It yeah. was it was a it was just yeah, and the crazy. cash register, half the items we had weren't in it. And I was just like, just ring it up as a coors, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to back up uh to kind of fit also with what your question was in regards to the beginnings of, of all of this. When John first called me about the idea, um oh, he, yeah, I he asked that. about so there there used to be a, a, a venue bar in town called the Coffee Clutch. And the coffee clutch was one of like the old crossroads or, or a lot of the old school places in Huntsville that don't exist anymore. The mm -hmm. coffee clutch is a bar that's right next to a coffee shop that sold coffee beans and ground up beans and really good coffee. What? And uh, that was the place, man. I mean, for, for people that were lovers of singer songwriters, for, for blues, for rock and roll, I mean, really it just was a unique spot in Huntsville that really had a great history. And, and John and I spent a lot of time in that place. And he was asking me, he said, hey, well, what do you think about opening that place back up? It's been closed for years. And uh, unfortunately, through the 
basically the the person that leases both the places. I was like, there's no way. Everybody knows this guy is probably not going to let that happen again. He was not real happy with the bar mm -hmm. over there to begin with. So that was kind of the beginning of it, which I think is real neat because like in our story, it starts with the love of, of previous music venues in Huntsville. And that's what this has always been since the beginning of, of John and I having that first conversation is paying homage to these, these places that have really made Huntsville's music history a rich place. These safe sp spaces where people can go and enjoy being around each other, they can dance, they can sing with the music and all that. And uh, most of the time, not playing a ton of covers. There were a lot of original music that were, that were brought to these old, uh, older places in Huntsville. So that's what we, and you can see when you look around the place, we've been, we've been referred to as the new coffee clutch numerous times, especially in the last two or three weeks. Yeah. People just con consistent. It's shaped similar. Uh, it's the same energy, the same feel. And hell, some of the older people are in their like late sixties and early seventies and, and starting to get out again and getting out again yeah. and enjoying themselves. And it's just mm -hmm. a beautiful thing to me. That's, that's incredible compliments. We, we, we hear stuff like that when we're not even open a full three months, people are saying mm -hmm. you are already a staple that, that feels good. Like old school Huntsville. We're like, yeah, well, I agree. You know, <laughs> when I first stepped in here, it feels like it's been here for a long time and, I, not, and that's a good thing. You know, yeah. it doesn't, was the objective. yeah, it doesn't feel like, oh, they're brand new trying to figure everything out. Still, I mean, it, it felt established and that was what been open for what, two months at that point or two and a half, three yeah. months. Oh yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's a pretty big feat, you know, and I just had a conversation with my buddies today, you know, he's going through some stuff. And uh, I was trying to give him some words of encouragement and everything, you know, trying to pull some bullshit out of my <laughs> hat, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I really wanted to help him out some way. And I was looking back on my life of some of the stuff I've had troubles with and, you know, some of the things that I did to try to get over obstacles. And I, I guess the biggest thing I could suggest to him is, you know, there's no progress that happens without kind of some kind of resistance, you know. If you don't have resistance with what you're doing, you're probably not doing it right, right. Or, or you're not going to you're not going to succeed. So you have to have resistance, you know, and it sounds like you had that resistance at the beginning. And I think oh, that's still do every day. Well, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's never going to stop, but you know, one thing at a time, you know, eventually it's never going to stop, but it's going to become, you know, manageable. I don't know if you're at that point now <laughs> to where, <laughs> to where it's manageable for you. Not yet. But I, I imagine this, uh, when you say full-time job, you're probably 12, 16 hours a day still, right? He uh, is. Yeah. I have a full-time job. Okay. So, uh, uh, he's, I, we, I pay him a salary yeah. to manage the place and yeah. manage the calendar and be here for deliveries, that kind of thing. Cause I have to, have to work sure. eight to five and I'm a single parent. So, yeah. so, so how do you, a, how do you go about juggle. booking, um, the, talent here do they come asking you to play or do you go 50, looking for it or 50 it's about 50 50 what about, what you say it's like half and half as far as people contacting us versus us contacting people yeah yeah i mean so um my previous experience was like i said uh concerts on the dock at low mill um that's kind of how i cut my teeth and you know i learned from people like jeff goltz at the old crossroads like mm. really put me under his wing in regards to the music business side yeah. of things. Like, here's a contract. Here's these logistics of just the basics. Right. And then, and then low mill, um, gave me a great deal of experience in regards to booking. You know, I would get lucky. I'd have a friend just be like, Oh, I just heard this band, in, you know, in Birmingham. And my buddy here in Florence is in the band and that's St. Paul and the broken bones. And we paid them next to nothing to play on the back dock of this cotton mill art center now. Mm. And now they're selling out arenas and, yeah. and, and, and selling out the rhyme and, and like shovels and rope and mandolin orange, these bands that are just massive now. I just got lucky. Yeah. Now, shovels and rope, I saw one YouTube video and that was it. I mean, one. I didn't see a second video and I said, we're booking that. Right. Like <laughs> they are so raw and rough and rugged and Southern and all of the things that just really just jumped into my heart. But that was it was a cheat sheet, man. It wasn't the real deal. It wasn't all the, all the things that now uh, that I and John are having to deal with because back then it was like, it was a set budget that we had in regards to like every Friday night, this is it. So when I told those bands, this is how much we got we're, when there's no wiggle room, this is it. Yeah. Right. Um, and then at the end of it, it was whether they said yes or not. And then, and then go from there. Well, I didn't have any stock in, 
in that place, in that art center. I didn't own anything. I wasn't a part of that place. I was just an employee that got paid next to nothing, peanuts, to bring some of this great music in. Nice. Now it's a different story. And now, uh, you know, I think one of the biggest struggles, at least for myself and I know for John too, is when you try to find talent, you want to stick with your vision. And, and John and I both have a love for bluegrass, Americana, that roots music that we don't feel that Huntsville has had a permanent home for. Mm -hmm. Has there, have there been bands in those genres that have played in Huntsville? Absolutely. Old Crossroads Coffee Clots used to have the old Crows and Avett brothers, Colonel Bruce Hampton, all of these like really roots and, and, and bluegrass and kind of uh, Americana bands. Now it's in a situation where like you want to balance, you have to balance what your vision is musically, what you want to bring to the table and bring something fresh to the community. You want people to look at your place and say, they bring something fresh to the table. But then you also balance it with, man, what's going to work behind the bar? Because that's how we make our money is how much beer and liquor we sell. Yeah. And for people like John and I, it's a struggle because we're not booze peddlers, man. Like yeah. we're not, we don't have this thing in our head that we're like, how many people are we going to get drunk tonight? Yeah. <laughs> but right. that's how we pay the bills. <laughs> and that's a, this dynamic that is this double-edged sword. It's real tricky. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially in these first couple months, because you put something up there that you're like, I believe in that music. Yeah. I believe it's real. I believe the songwriting is incredible. These musicians are badass. And you put it on stage and it might be a night that, that a very small crowd comes and you don't make much behind the bar. Yeah. So then you're now you're saying, well, do I do, do, do we do our vision or do we do what makes sales? Yeah. And yeah, we found yeah. we're going to have to kind of split it. Yeah. It's, it's tough like, though. We're going to have a Saturday night where it's, it might just be a cover band, but they get a big draw. And then Friday night will be a band we like that nobody's ever heard of and hopefully we can convince people to come here and if you like jazz july 13th josh Couts will be here with this group that's right <laughs> hopefully um i don't know if our schedule <clears throat> hopefully we can get get it out before then but if yeah. not is there anything that you, i'm hoping to get this out in the middle of july um, oh, okay somewhere around there so is there anything that you want to promote from from that point on kind of city like, vibes is uh another jazz so that's uh um Quentin's what's Quentin's last name? Uh Quentin Roddy. Yeah. Uh he is he owns um a, a, a music uh school in town called Musicology. He's got 750 students. Wow. In the size of of Huntsville, it's just I cannot grasp. Last time I talked to him, he had over 500, and that was only like 2 years ago. And last time I talked, he's this guy, and he's been a dear friend and used to play at the old Crossroads okay. in a band called Fritz Pazitz, which was this jazz fusion band, mm -hmm. super fun. And he played drums for them. And so now he's opened the school, 750 students. I mean, 750 of our youth are learning from some of the best in Huntsville how to play music. Yeah. And uh, so he has, he plays the vibe, vibraphone, which is a little bit different from, um, xylophone but basic con same basic mm -hmm. concept but what's really neat is like what i love about the jazz community too is is these guys will they'll have a band playing and halfway through you're going to see some of the big dogs walk through that door yeah and josh couch is one of the big dogs he and he plays jazz guitar like you i'm telling you jazz josh couch could play with anybody in any big city in the world yeah. he's that good and he just waltzed in with a guitar on his back, like not pretentious, just walked in because he just got done with the gig. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, Quentin's like kept on stage. And so they they just, they do that. They jam together. It's mm -hmm. similar to bluegrass. Bluegrass is yeah. the same way. Like if you have a bluegrass band or if you're picking around a fire or in someone's backyard, someone drives by and here, oh, I got my banjo. Let me bring it. And like, Be right you back. Know, <laughs> it's just that's that, that community sense of music for music's sake, yeah. not for flashy money or anything like that it's music for music's sake and i think that's what inspires john and i um in, in general and the vision that we have for this place whatever genre that fits in yeah. is is uh is the community of music sure you know is there a, a website or facebook or how, how can we yes. find out what you're all com. okay that's has our ph uh, not with the a ph <laughs> uh, not there. has our calendar <laughs> it's not a lot I'm on it soon. right now <laughs> yeah. we're being in the summer, a lot of bands are on tour. Sure. It's really difficult. And like we're, we're just talking right before the show started about, especially with local musicians, you know, 
you'll talk to their main point of contact. Yeah, we'd well, love to play July 26th. Book it. And then they'll call back, ah, our bass player, he's in this other band and they're playing somewhere on July 26th. So it's, it's just really hard to book stuff right now. Uh, it's not, not terribly difficult to get individual musicians. We try to keep it kind of like singer, songwriter, solo artist <clears throat> Wednesday, Thursday, and then full bands Friday, Saturday. Yeah. Um, but so there's not a lot on there right now. There's a lot that's tentative in our calendar that we just can't publish yet. But, no. but yeah, and then follow us on Instagram, St. Stephen's Music. St. Stephen's Music Hall on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, and we try to, and pretty much as soon as we get a band confirmed, we put it on our website. We put we build an event on on uh, Facebook and then start putting posts up on social media. So, yeah. so if you follow us on social media, you, you should see it. Let's see what we got. Well, the growth of Huntsville, I mean, from shoot, from especially you being here as long as you have, I mean, has the growth in the last five years from from where you started, it probably didn't grow that much, what, in the 15, 20 years, but then within this past five years, doesn't it seem like it just exploded? Oh, 100%. I mean, like I, mean, I said, I moved here in 1984, and in, like, late – like 1997, 98, I moved to Phoenix for a year. And when mm-hmm. I left Huntsville, I, I, I was like, I, besides family, I will not come back. Yeah. It had nothing for me. Sure. Literally, it had nothing for me. Low Mill hadn't started yet. Uh, the music scene was kind of really just kind of settling in a weird spot at that point. Um, and uh, I was just done. I mean, at, at that point, man, I would I would travel. I traveled all over the world, Europe and all over the world. and and. Uh, when I would fly back home or I would drive on 65 and I'd see that sign for Huntsville, I'd go, <sighs> <laughs> like, every time, yeah. every 100% of the time, I just, ugh, that yeah. sigh of like, ugh, I'm back here. Mm. And uh, ended up staying out in Phoenix for a year and, and very quickly found out that was not my home. Now, I love my family and I'm close, very close to my family out there. And, uh, it was too violent. It was too big. There's too much, too much big city. I just knew I was not made for a big city. I was up there for about six months. Yeah. I loved it. Oh yeah. But Sedona, Flagstaff. Well, it was time Southern to go. Coast. It was time to go. Yeah. <laughs> so I get it. And, and yeah. what was really neat in, in just in my own life process and, and, and history, when I moved back to Huntsville was when these fireworks were just starting mm. these like community fireworks like low mill boom and this boom 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 all these little things were just starting now that are very established and, and big sure. and, and community minded and all that um but yeah i mean no orion no orion you're driving to memphis nashville birmingham atlanta mm-hmm. to every every big show you maybe get two shows a, a, a year at at the uh, vbc and that was about it um mm. And so really seeing that grow slowly and being excited about it. But then, yeah, it was like growth for 25 years and then five years, ex- just absolute explosions yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And um, I think it's real neat to see a lot of the old school people from Huntsville that have not moved. A lot of the musicians that have been here for that long. I mean, there are a lot of musicians that have been here for 25 to 35 years. Alan Little, Dave Anderson, Microwave Dave, all these have stayed here. They've never really, you, you can see, they never really had this vision of being any bigger in regards to moving off and making money and fame and all that. So the music scene has continued to get better. But then nobody's moving off, and they're just staying here, and just that gumbo of all it just keeps like yeah. simmering. Stirring up. <laughs> and then these new younger bands are just ridiculous. I mean, the the younger generation coming up, like in their like early to mid twenties, they are prodigies left and right. I mean, it's just really amazing to see it. Um, I think it's really, you know, really. Of course, Muscle Shoals being the history that it has, you know, I think, you know. When you look at history, probably not on par, but uh, as far as the musicians that are around this area now, matches the Muscle Shoals back in its heyday, I think. I mean, you know just as many people around here, musicians as I do. Well, I'm sure more. And uh, I think the town around here is just phenomenal. And when I first came here, I guess at the end of December, and I talked about this in another podcast, one of the first bands I saw saw was Black Label. Mm -hmm. And I went and saw them, you know, at, at the page, and I'm like, how in the world are these guys here? I don't understand <laughs> that these guys are this good 
And yeah, not that Huntsville wasn't nothing, but I'm like, why are you not touring? You know, I, I just didn't get it. it. You know, they played a lot of the original stuff, and I'm like, I've never heard that song before. Who are they covering? Well, that's that's our original. I mean, man, mm-hmm. why are a, they here? A friend that moved here from, I mean, originally from Virginia, but I think he moved here from DC. Uh, and saw Charlie Howe for the first time. Yeah. Snake Doctor is like, what the hell is this guy doing in Huntsville? Yep. Like, why is he not in Nashville? Yep. The so I songs think songs he writes. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, God. and that just goes to prove that the, the talent around here, and I think people are recognizing that now, and that's probably why they have stayed so long. It, like you said, it's a big old crock pot, well, and, it, and it's been summoned for so long that it's starting to get noticed. I worked over a five year period, and I was kind of like Evan when I was a kid. I, I mean, I grew up here from birth. So. Mm. I was pretty anxious to get out of Huntsville and I'm f- almost, I'm 49. So, you know, when I was 21 in the mid nineties, early nineties, mid nineties, there just wasn't, a, there was a couple of clubs in town and that's about it. And most of them were just rock yeah. and you had the page or you had, uh, I think maybe the crossroads that started to open around that time, but you had uh, a place called uh, the vapors on the parkway that it was pretty much a rock club. And yeah. That's about it. And uh didn't have really anything other than the clutch that had, you know, original artists. And that was something that shocked me. But anyway, I'm getting off topic. So I took a job with AT and T I I worked in forty states in five years. I was gone for pretty much five years, living at a hotel. Forty states. For, and I was so anxious to see the country and get the hell away from Huntsville for a minute. And man, after I saw the country, you couldn't get me back down so fast enough. <laughs> and yeah. then, so that was from 99 to 2004. And then I went to college for a couple of years in South Georgia. And then I was really dying to get back down. So I hated that. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's come a long way and almost to a little bit to our detriment. If we'd opened this place 10 years ago, we'd be crushing but now there's just a lot of competition. There's a lot of places to go in this town now. You know, Mid-City used to be a dive uh, mall, you know. I remember when they built that mall, I asked my dad, why did they build that mall out in the middle of the cotton fields way <laughs> outside of town? They used to, back then, the loop, the Huntsville Loop, was Bob Wallace Spartman. That was the edge of town. Mm, yeah. Once you crossed Spartman on University Drive, it was Highway 72, it was cotton fields. Yeah. There's nothing out there. Man, I sh- and I was like, why'd they build them all out in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> like, so far away. Well, they had a plan. <laughs> little, did, little did they know. Yeah. Well, now you got the Mid-City there and Orion, and then you got this. And then downtown, you pretty much had, a, you know, like the Jazz Factory would have some interesting stuff. They were on the square. You had a couple spots on the square, and that was pretty much it. And like Humphreys. Uh, but now there's, you know, there's so much stuff downtown on the, and in that entertainment, now they create these entertainment districts and you got the area of the furniture factory and now they're bringing back the lumber yard over there. No, right. The same people that do Orion, the TVG hospitality are behind that. Okay. And, uh, they're building a space out there. That's, that's actually a microwave days day this, in October. Is, I think it's their soft opening, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if we're allowed to say that. But edit that. Uh, uh, no, uh, I, actually, I think we put our save to date out okay. yesterday. So uh, okay. o- cool. October 13th at the Lumberyard. At the Lumberyard. Sweet. But yeah, if we'd opened this place <laughs> 10 years ago, we'd be crushing it. So, but now it's like, man, there's just a lot to choose from. Yeah. Well, I don't think you have nothing to worry about, to be honest with you. I mean, as soon as, you know, it's just all word of mouth. You know, yeah. as soon as, you know, the people that has been coming here is going to tell that person, they're going to tell that person. It's, I have... Yeah, we're definitely seeing a lot of repeat faces for yeah. sure, and uh, it's just got to just keep growing. Hopefully, we can weather the storm until it until it gets there. Yeah. <laughs> the last month we did really well. This yeah. month has been more of a struggle, I guess, as people traveling and yeah. plus it's a hundred degrees outside. Yeah, tomorrow's going to be the worst. I think yeah. uh, that we've had so far. So I'm going to stay inside. So I'd hate to but, I hate to go backwards, but Let's talk about Perth a little bit. Okay. How 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 long did you live there? Like the first four years of my life. I don't, okay. You I don't, don't remember much of it? No. All right, well, then we won't talk about it. <laughs> no, I mean, the main thing I do remember, and and I'll use this nickname here and there, email addresses, and like all this, Black Swan, because the, um, the logo for the city of Perth is a black swan. Mm. And most people have not ever seen a black swan in person. You see the white swans. Right. Um, and they're in every city park, any pond, pond or lake that you see. They're ever they're beautifully black with with uh, real bright orange and Bright-up. red beaks. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of my main main memory of that. It's really neat too because I heard black swan is actually a term referred to people in like uh, the stock market when for some reason that the stock market just goes haywire. They yeah. don't understand. Like out of nowhere, something changes very quickly. They use the term black swan. Well, Dutch explorers that that were finding Australia, they came across a black swan for the first time. They've not seen it anywhere else in the world. So it was something that was brand new mm. that you've never seen before. Kind yeah. of just like shocked them. They're, it like ended up being this symbol of like uh, immediate change or, or, you know, it was just real neat. Yeah, I got the opportunity to go out there for about six weeks. I absolutely loved it out there. And this was, man, that's a oh, 95 or so. Mm -hmm. So obviously things have probably changed a little bit, but I absolutely loved it out there. I mean, the people out there were some of the nicest people I've ever met. So I just, oh. want, I just wanted, was it your family that moved away from there? So, so yeah, you? my dad was a missionary, so it's just me and my brother. Gotcha. That we're, we okay. have, I have four siblings, me and my, and my younger brother, my three sisters, and my parents were all born here. Um, so we lived in Perth for four years, and then in Brisbane, Queensland, which mm. is literally the exact opposite coast. Yeah. We went from the West Coast all the way to the That's East where I was Coast. That's Brisbane. And uh, Queensland is, is a state or a territory bigger than the state of Texas yeah. with a coast that is longer than probably even California's coast. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the top of that coast is where the Great Barrier Reef is and all that. So I grew up like in those beaches getting pummeled by like 14 foot tall waves at like eight yeah. years old. <laughs> like, yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh -huh. Well, hey guys, um, is there anything that you want to talk about that I haven't brought up? Like uh, future plans or anything? Right now we're open Wednesday through Saturday. We're going to start next month opening on Tuesdays. Okay. So... <clears throat> Like Evan stated earlier, we we kind of modeled this thing after kind of a hyper blend. Like I said, we initially wanted to reopen the clutch. That was the whole. I, I literally wanted to use their trade to like just reopen the coffee clutch. Mm. And then it was like everybody I talked to was like, never gonna happen. So I was like, all right, we'll open something our own, but we'll model it after the clutch and the crossroads kind of because crossroads. So when he and I met, that was the thing to do on Thursday nights. He went to the crossroads, watch Snake Doctor. Yeah. It like it was always packed. It was always a good time. And, uh, I, uh, I was like, man, we need to, we need a snake doctors. We need a regular band that plays a weekly kind of thing. And we recently had a, a gentleman play here by the name of Michael Goldsmith and, uh, his band, Stephen, uh, Stephen Jackson, Michael Goldsmith. And I apologize guys, uh, uh Chris Cook mm -hmm. and Hunter, what's Hunter Oakland? Renfro? Oh, no. Is that his last name, Renfro? I'm not sure. Sorry, oh. Hunter. I can't remember your last <laughs> name. Anyway, Chris played here about a week before Michael did, and I was working behind the bar that night, and I kind of looked up the clock, and I was like, this guy's been playing for over almost an hour and a half, and he has played nothing but original songs, and every one of them were as good as the next. Mm. It's like, he is a hell of a songwriter. So uh, we... And then turns out he was in the Michael Goldsmith band and Michael's can write just as good as Chris can. <laughs> He's got a million songs. So Evan knows Stephen real well. So, and Stephen played at our grand opening. Uh, so we sat down with Stephen. I was like, I want to do something with you guys. Like I want give you a night, a week night, whatever night you want. I don't care. And we decided on Tuesdays and, uh, initially I just wanted to be the Michael Goldsmith man every Tuesday, like yeah. snake, snake doctors were. And then that kind of morphed into, well, what if we invited other people to play with us? And, and then now it's become where they're just going to kind of curate. It's not an open mic, but it'll, they'll have three or four or five artists that sit in with them yeah. and play. And they'll, it, it's going to be kind of themed. So they'll have like an R and B night. They'll have a blues night. They'll have an Americana night. They'll have a, a rock and roll night. And, different well, I think artists that's a great idea. Yeah. and then hopefully i think we were talking with josh i don't know if it's okay to say this about josh or josh. yeah and doing a thing with josh couts that'll be a monthly thing where he's going to curate jazz musicians so yeah i was i've heard two things in here that really made me very happy and kind of surprised me i've heard multiple artists standing on stage between songs say, man, it's so great to be here. It's so nice to be able to play somewhere that wants us to play original music. And I was like, what do you mean? Yeah. And apparently a lot of venues 
don't want you to play original music. They want the covers. And uh, that's what sells the booze, man. And I was gets the girls dancing. I was covers astonished. I'm like, we have this town is full of really great songs. Or that North Alabama. You just if you open the umbrella to North Alabama, my God, the original the songwriters we have. Like, how could you not want original music? That then I can't I couldn't even wrap my brain around that. So that was really exciting to hear that uh, that we are facilitating original music. Uh, doesn't mean that's 100%, but if we have a focus and a drive to bring that to the table, then it it makes people excited. I mean, we had, I booked a buddy of mine, um, Chris Simmons, and Chris Simmons has played with some of the biggest names, man, with the Black Crows and like all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he hadn't played in Huntsville in four years probably and just popped in my head, oh, Chris Simmons, man, he lives outside of Birmingham, called him. He came up and he did three hours of originals, not a single cover, three hours, yeah. which is unheard of for even big names to sure. do something like that. Mm, yeah. And at the end of it, um, pulled him aside. It's a great show, man, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, dude, I have not once done that in my entire life. This guy's in his early 40s, mid 40s, probably like us. He said he's never once done that in his entire life. Mm. So how special a moment is that? For, and the crowd that night, pin drop silent on a Thursday night, probably 35 people in here and just whoo, like that focus. focus on. And and that's another thing too, is like, just like the, the, the Orion does a great job of this because Orion's focus, number one, is, is, is the artist first, patron second, which is a really weird equation. Yeah. You, you would think, well, no. So every venue is always patrons, patrons, patrons. Sure. They're the ones that make us money. They sell the concessions. It's all about the patrons. If you make the musicians happy, trust me, your patrons are going to be happy. No. Yeah. Because the musicians are going to play this place in a different way than they play anywhere else. Yeah. Like the people that set foot on the Ryman. The musicians that set foot on the Ryman play a different show than they do anywhere else. Yeah. And the musician or the patrons benefit because of those musicians paying so much homage to that place. Well, Bert Kreischer played Orion at the comedian. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. His tour came through yeah. and played Orion. He loved it so much. He and his wife flew back here to see like widespread or somebody. Mm-hmm. Oh but, yeah. Cause they just wanted to be back in the Orion. Yeah. And they flew back from Texas just to go see, see or LA. Oh, Excuse Jack me, White, still Jack LA. White played it on, on Saturday night and came back Sunday night to, mm. to see the, uh, the black keys. You yeah. know, musicians that, um, you know, and, and sometimes musicians are going to be your best connections to booking sure, as well. Yeah. But if musicians are happy and they come in and they put on a different show here and it's unique in some way. So, oh, we forgot to talk about this. So Kings Hayes is a local band. Uh, one of the, the, the lead guitarists, Jason Humphreys, is uh, with Don Osborne. And Don Osborne band is another big, huge Huntsville local act. And they're very soulful, kind of almost Muscle Shoalsy. Like Don Osborne is just one of the greatest singers, great originals, all of that. Well, then Jason Humphreys, her man, plays just. He might be the best guitar player in Huntsville. It's just stupid how good he is. Yeah. So he has a side band um, called Kings Hayes. They do, they have some originals, but they just, the covers they do, they'll do Rage Against the Machine, Metallica. Uh, Pantera even like I mean they just go all but they play it to just this extent they're like oh, oh my god like it is that good yeah. and so <clears throat> excuse me so they were playing uh, the other day and I went and saw them and I'm standing talking to Don and I'm like Jason had, had approached me about King's Haze playing here and I was like man dude I want you to on a personal level I just love you and everybody else loves you mm-hmm. but this place is small man <laughs> like you guys are playing like wall of sound kind of like like take your skin off kind of loud and I was like dude I I want it here but I think we'd have to turn it down so low that it might take away from the energy of your band yeah. and so the three of us Don and, and Jason and I started talking about well, do we have any other options what can we do and so literally through that conversation Jason talked to his drummer, um, Rashad, incredible drummer. He has this instrument that is basically like this multi-instrument instrument, but it's an acoustic, like, percussion instrument. It's called the shitar. <laughs> 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 and so he says, well, 
Why don't we do this? Why don't we do a mixture of the Dawn Osborne band and Dawn's songs that she's written in an acoustic style with that instrument and then morph it into King's Hayes, which is a metal band, but playing acoustic. Yeah. It's kind of MTV unplugged with King's Hayes. Yeah. So, the, I mean, that kind of stuff to me on a personal level is so exciting. Oh, yeah, and, and I talked with John uh, about that in the early days of this. It's like, how can... How can we create an atmosphere for the musicians and for the patrons that is unique? Like, yeah. what, what are we going to... And I've talked to hip-hop artists, you know, in town, the neighbors uh, and Quantaphonics, like, talking to them about, you usually do these very high-energy, DJ-based, loud stuff. Well, what about doing a lounge set? Mm -hmm. Hip-hop lounge with acoustic guitars. And, like, and people are like, yeah, not in Huntsville, because that's big city stuff. You go to Chicago, New York, or L.A., that's really edgy music kind of stuff, then you'll see stuff like that. But in Huntsville, it's pretty standard with, like, you got these genres that are pretty set in yeah. place. But, man, when you start breaking outside of those genres and realize that this music is great no matter how what format you put it in, yeah. then you have that night. I'm just stupid thrilled about this night. <laughs> sure, yeah. I just can't yeah. wait. Oh, my goodness. That, that we talked about that? that. It's the 29th. It's a Saturday. Mm. But yeah, it's going to work. Yeah. They're so excited about it. And, and it's really going to bring what I'd like to see is what people think about it. And made people uncomfortable because that to me, that's, that's how you branch out. Yeah. Not just in regards to genre, but just in the way that in, the music impacts you is when you branch out of your comfort zone, sure. when you don't listen to covers, when you listen to original music and how. Even when you hear a band play the same set 40 times and then that 41st time they just shake it up, then you're like, oh, wow, now I see a different perspective of this music yeah. that really blows my mind. And now I'm going to start listening to something that's different now. Oh, you know? Really, really cool just to be a venue that's like wants people to think outside the box. Or, and well, I was saying there was two things I was really proud of. The second thing was when one of the jazz bands was playing, I think it was Burdette Quintet, said, uh, Man, it's so nice that we have a home for jazz in Huntsville now. And I was like, I didn't know jazz didn't have a home. Mm -hmm. it, ha it hasn't really. But had a if we could be home. that home, by all means, I'm not a huge jazz fan. I don't drive around listening to jazz in my car, and I couldn't name you 10 jazz musicians probably. But when I hear it, I love it. I am it. the exact same way. I, I love don't, it. I don't tune into it. My, well, some friends of mine had just started mm -hmm. really listening to it. And I. I've never heard these friends listen to this, that kind of stuff ever. I'm like, what are you all doing? <laughs> what is this? And you, you know, I've always, obviously everybody's heard jazz before, but when you sit back and kind of, you know, but when you see it, Oh, it's all about right, that's, play, that's what I was getting ready to say. You know, I heard, I heard them playing. I'm like, yeah, that's cool and everything, but I got about a 30 minute tolerance for it, but we could, we could have sat in here all night and listened to those guys. Yeah. We had some place to go but when i was in high school i was a typical high school kid i graduated high school in 93 so in 92 93 i'm listening to red hot chili peppers mm -hmm. and i'm listening to to uh dr dre and snoop Dogg, <laughs> sure. and uh my mother I, I, I we can't end this podcast without mentioning my mother is a lady named monica mock and most people in in the music in the southeast know who she is we love our mom um she bought me a CD and gave it to me and I put it in my car and it was a band called Olden in the way, which was Jerry Garcia's bluegrass band. And I was just like, ah, what is that? Yeah, e -check, e -check. <laughs> <laughs> and she wouldn't let up on it. And, uh, that fall, she took me to the station Inn, which is a little blue bluegrass bar in Nashville. And, uh, and I saw it. And the minute I saw it, I was hooked. Yeah. I mean, I was only, I got a guitar. About six months later, I got a mandolin. Uh, I mean, I, I couldn't listen to enough bluegrass music. And when you see the proficiency, the skill level that these guys have, these instruments, and it's the same with jazz. It's like the when you see it, it's just like, my God, they are so damn talented. Yep. <clears throat> and then the fact that it, to, to it just almost seems like gibberish. It's so all over the place, you know, but then a guy like Josh Couts can walk me with his guitar and go, Oh, you're playing blues heaven and B flat. Let me jump in <laughs> on that. Ah. And it's like, man, you guys are good. You guys are so damn talented. And if we can be a home to that talent then hallelujah. Well, you know, That's what's amazing about amazing. people like Jerry Garcia is because he was studying jazz. 
Mm. Those bluegrass guys, I mean, uh, Grateful Dead, like those guys were studying jazz. Mm. Like if you go back and listen to some of them recordings, you will see it clear as day. It's just a, like those great musicians, they, they pluck from all the genres to where like, yeah, you can't even call the Grateful Dead a genre. They are their own genre yeah. because they brought like six different genres together into that band, mm -hmm. you know? amazing well, hey man <clears throat> we're gonna cut this off here if you're all good with that i'd like to share something oh absolutely <laughs> really quick i'd like to well then we're gonna cut that part out that i said we're gonna end so good <laughs> <laughs> what i'd like to do is is uh end this with um something i wrote the first night that we were in the other building and uh, why it inspired me to write this was based on being in in the microwave dave music education foundation one of the first things you have to do in a nonprofit is create a mission statement mm -hmm. And it took us a year to come up with one. Mm. That's how, because you're so particular about, you got to say words that you mean, and they got to stick through time and on all this. And so I was in, in our old place the first night by myself and, um, I felt the need and, and, and when I brought it to John, I, I said, John, this doesn't have to be your mission statement. It doesn't have to be St. Stephen's mission statement at all. I just wrote it in a way that like, I needed something visually and physically to go back to. Five years down the road, hey, we're killing it, and we're you know we're driving Benzes and big boats, and oh, <laughs> not that that'll ever happen. Boats and hoes, but, <laughs> 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 but just this is music is a world of ego. Musicians, venues, it's a world of ego. Once you get people liking you and people just constantly feeding you compliments all the time, you've got to ground yourself. You have to have that sense of you got to stick with your vision. That's why we're going to be successful because I hate compliments. See, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to share. I'd like to share Don't this take them uh, well. just to kind of to kind of end this sure. off because it, it really, to me, it, it, like in my feeling, it's like what I I personally wanted this place to represent. It says, "May these walls give joy to all of those who set foot inside them. May these walls promote a reverence to music." May the owners of these walls give of their hearts to share the gift of music and respect each other. May the owners balance the journey of this place with their duties outside of these walls. May the art and music lovers that come through these doors know that they are loved and to be inspired. May the musicians know they are respected for their craft and are welcome in our home. May the libations never outshine the pure joy of sharing the stories of music. May all of our conflicts end swiftly and peacefully. May the quality of our performers encourage others to work toward their dreams. May hugs be prevalent and kisses a treasure. May these walls give joy to all of those who set foot inside them. How long did it take you to write that? Like an hour, probably maybe. So less. it took you a year. <laughs> That's actually Terrific. hanging. That's what's on that whiteboard right oh, there. Oh wow! The front. That is really really cool, man. <clears throat> Sounds like you've thought that out for, for quite a while before you wrote it down. But you said you wrote that in an hour. That's pretty cool. No, I mean I've written poetry most of my life, so I think once the once the overall theme was there, then it didn't take that long. Mm -hmm. But it, it was important to me because I could see the future, man. I could see being in this, and if it was successful. I'm guilty of ego just like anybody. And and when you get fed compliments and people say, you guys are awesome every time you keep hearing that. I mean, that's why big celebrities have, they, they do stupid stuff because of that. Yep. And they get to be drug addicts and they get to this and this and this because they just can't handle that. That ego is just so much. They sure. never do any wrong. Right. And John and I, I, I know <laughs> because we've been friends for as long as we have, neither of us have that in us. Yeah. And I don't think we need to have that ever in, in our future, no matter how successful we get, we need to be grounded and need to say, well, it's really our vision and, and there, there's never an end. It's, it just continues to be a journey of sharing this, this gift of music with everybody, man. That's what we're here for. Well, you're definitely uh, approachable. You know, I told you the story of when I came in here. <laughs> so um, that, that's one good thing. Um, I would just, you know, suggest to keep that that humbleness that you all have and the approachability that you have no matter how big you get and i, I know it's going to get big point. and i know i'm going to promote as much as i can everybody i talk to is going to hear about this place if they don't know about it yet because i think you got a great thing going here Thank not you. not only is it a great venue but you're like you said you're providing a place for, for songwriters to come and, and and show their craft that you know 
most places around here don't really do. So yeah. I'm sure I can thank you for them too. If they, they haven't <laughs> already thanked you. Right. So, um, we're trying guys yeah. hit us up. <laughs> so we're going to end it here. If that's cool, cool with you guys. Um, <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to put all the stuff that we talked about in the description as far as the links to find out the schedule, uh, what's going to be coming in the future. And by all means, you need to stop by here if you haven't yet. Um, even if you don't know what's going on here, something's going on here every night. Well, right? that's what, yeah, we got interviewed by Channel 31. I, I told him, I said, I want it to eventually get to a point where if you don't have anything to do, just go to St. Stephen's. Yeah. There's something interesting that's going to happen. Yep, absolutely. I agree 100%. Well, thank you guys once again for Thanks. having us, and we're going to Thanks cut this over. Thanks, Cheers. Thanks, guys. All Appreciate right. it.